YouTube fan community, monkeys fans, random people on the internet. My name is Giggins. We are here today to talk about the monkeys' fifth album and kind of like their last official like studio album with all four guys in it: the Birds, the Bees, and the Monkeys. So this is released on Coal Gems, like all their other albums at that time, and um, this was quite a departure for them. You know, at this point in their career, this is like three albums deep of them really like trying to prove they could do it themselves. Um, for those who don't know who the Monkees were, they were a made-up band for TV based on the Beatles of Hard Day's Night to make a really cool, zany, fun show about four dudes hanging out, living with each other, trying to meet girls, and driving a fun car, and playing some good rock and roll along the way. Um, and that lasted for a couple of years. In the original early days, basically most of their songs were written for them. They would do some of their vocals, actually most of their vocals, and then maybe like a guitar part here and there that they could sneak in and try to do it. But for the most part, they were like told, no, you're the face of this thing. We'll take care of the behind the scenes stuff. You guys go out and do it. But they got fed up with that real quick. So, you know, in, in short order, they actually ended up touring, you know, playing their songs live, you know, being a band. They became an actual band uh, because they wanted to prove to the world they can do it. And if they say they can do it, they can do it. They don't make false claims. So here we go. They ended up doing the Headquarters album, which was like largely completely on their own, and the, you know, whatever it's called, Capricorn Jones, etc. LP um, after that. And then this one came out. So the Birds, the Bees, and the Monkeys. This came out in early April. I'm sorry, late April, April 22nd, um, 1968. Um, it was recorded in spurts at, at the end of 67 through the beginning of 68. Um, and this is kind of like a solo Monkees LP. So at most of this album, like 99% of it is each guy doing their own thing in their own studio with their own session musicians doing their own thing. And then like the best tracks got compiled and they called it the Monkees and put it out as a Monkees album. Um, and it sounds like four guys in four different studios with four different groups of musicians playing four different types of material slapped onto one album and then called The Monkees. Um, while it's not my favorite Monkees album, there are a lot of fantastic songs on here. And I do enjoy it overall as a whole as a listen. I think it's a fun listen. It's just, it's disjointed just enough to make it feel like it's not a band. And they were trying really hard at this point to be a band. And here they were reverting to using other people's songs sometimes, or definitely focusing heavily on session musicians, which is normal, a lot of bands do that, but um, for a band that was being so gung-ho about, hey, this is us, this feels really, really unband like <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's really not a bad album, though. It was their first Monkees album um, to not hit the number one spot. All their other albums have done that so far. This one hit number three in the U.S., which, you know, is fine, but... Um, you know, 1968 was the slow decline for the Monkees. This was the beginning of the end. Like, you know, this thing came out, it featured a couple number one hits, or oh, at least one with Daydream Believer on here, um, which had been a single a few months earlier, December of 67. But, you know, by the time this thing came out, the TV show got canceled after two seasons, and by the end of the year, Peter Tork left the band, um, basically citing exhaustion. You know, because this was like a whirlwind... 15, 16 months of, like, non-stop TV, albums, touring, press, uh, you name it. You know, it was just a non-stop gig, so they were probably pretty tired. Um, that said, it's really not a bad album. Um, for me, it's almost like if you took the four solo Kiss albums from the late 70s and took the best bits out of that and then made, like, one album out of it, this is probably close to what this is. Um, the mono copy of this album. This is like right at the end of mono and stereo pressings. Uh, the mono copy is apparently extremely hard to find. I've never seen one. This is just a standard stereo copy from 1968. Um, so I'd like to get my hands on a mono copy someday. Apparently the mixes are just special enough to make it quite interesting to listen to. So that would be cool. Um, so as I said, this is mostly a solo Monkees album, you know, called The Monkees. The thing is, it's basically three of them. Peter is only on this thing for like maybe a guitar and he does the piano on Daydream Believer. He came up with the intro for that thing and plays piano throughout. That's it. There's no Peter on this album, but his picture's on it, and it says the monkeys, so if you were buying this in 1968, you probably assumed they all were on here doing their own thing, playing all the instruments and writing the songs. 
Um, a lot of them are written by them, like Davy Jones does Dream World and the poster. He co-wrote that one. Um, and then Mike Nesmith is all over this thing with some pretty great tracks. So, you know, it's um, it's an interesting album. We'll put it that way. But let's get into it. So, Dream World is the first song on this album, and it it's a bizarrely engaging track for me. Um, it's a unusual choice of an opener. It's not exactly the like grab your attention type track and throw you into the mix of the next monkeys album it's kind of like come on hang out and enter the dream world i mean it's 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 a bit of like a lullaby it's got this like sprightly tight snare drum that kind of you know prances along in the background um some really warm like glowing horns that kind of you know set this comfortable scene as if you're in your big comfy bed trying to go to sleep at night um, and these like sweeping dramatic strings create that feeling of a pleasant valley dream. You know, you're just kind of hanging out, grooving, and having a good time. Um, and Davy's vocals on top of it are just endearing and sweet, and his his classic typical Davy sound. Um, nothing wrong with that at all. But in typical me, I was reading more deeply into this, and you know the chorus, the the lines on this thing are interesting. You know, it's not real. It's not the way it seems to be. Um, you know, for me, I was taking it as like, all right, maybe he's thinking that the fans are thinking this is a full band effort, but he's like, hey, come into the dream world. I'll show you what's really going on here. This is all separate solo stuff, people. Like, this is what's really going on. Come on in. Let's hang out in the dream world. And maybe he's setting up the scene for the story, the arc of this album, being that it's all disjointed and all over the place. Maybe he's like setting up the feel. Or maybe he's just talking about a dream world about a girl. Let's let's just probably go with that. It's way too deep for that. Uh, Auntie's Municipal Court is the only song on this album with two monkeys. That's right. Two. Count them two. For the price of four. You get Davey. No, you don't. <laughs> Wrong guy. You get Mickey. It ends with a Y. It's the same thing. Mickey and Mike are on this one. And apparently Harry Nielsen is bumbling around back there somewhere. So a little bit of Nielsen. Touch of Schmilson in the night there. Um, I really like that Nesmith guitar flavor all over this thing, that, that country rock thing that he's got going on. Um, it, it's just a cool sound. You know, like the girl I know somewhere and, you know, songs like that. What am I doing hanging around? Like, um, that feel just works well. And it sounds like the sixties to me. And it sounds like a, just like a fun group. It's got that, that cool flavor. Um, <laughs> Mickey's voice on this song, I can... As I was playing this over and over again, because it's been a while since I've heard the whole thing, the only thing I can think of to compare it to was, like, you're at a party at a friend's house, or you're at a party at a stranger's house, okay, and you bring a couple friends over, and, like, you're starting to drink, you're just hanging out, having a good time, someone decides they have to go to the bathroom, and they, they wander the house, as you do, looking for the bathroom. It's your, first, it's your first time there, and you don't know where you're going, and you open up one door and realize it's a closet, it's not the bathroom, but... Inside that closet is a karaoke machine, and on that karaoke machine are some great songs. And so you pull it out and you start singing to yourself in your stoned out way. Um, and that's what this song sounds like to me. It sounds like Mickey was kind of stoned as he's singing this song. Um, but in that stoned uh, narrative, the vocals are very friendly and infectious, and um, I like the feel of it, I like the vibe that he gives off. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but I kind of like it because of that. So, good job, Mickey. <laughs> uh, we were made for each other. I really wonder how many, like, weddings this song was in, or how many, like, you know, love letters this was written in back in the 60s and 70s of people getting married or courting each other and said, hey, I think you're great. I think we were made for each other. Um, you know, Davey's got that really syrupy, you know, teen beat, heartthrob musings to his voice, and, um... You know, making listeners swoon for him, and he's got the whole vibe, the shtick going on. A lot of people apparently hate this song. It's fine. I like the message behind it. It's sweet. You know, I, I, if you're like, I don't know, falling in love with somebody for the first time, you'd probably be affected by this song. I'd say, yeah, I, I think I like what Davey's doing there. Um, not my favorite song, but it's short enough to be like, all right, we get the point, and we're good. Okay, next song, which is Tapioca Tundra, and it's Tapio Tapioca Tundra cannot speak today, man. Um, and that just comes out of nowhere. That's the problem with this album, is the sequencing. It doesn't have a point to any of the sequencing. 
And so you go from one extreme to the other, which is a little bit jarring. Um, but Tapioca Tundra is a fantastic far out song. It's got that psychedelic cowboy whistling intro and um, then you're just zapped off into this trippy western ex mind-bending experience with Mike, you know, with, with Papa Nez on lead reverb vocals here, um, taking us through this magical journey of, you know, it's all too much for me to take, you know, kind of feeling. Um, and it's got just the right bit of cowbell in there, but I like the changes that happen throughout this thing, the creative chord changes that happen throughout. Um, and what was once just a random poem is now just a random song. Apparently they aired it out again in 2012 for their reunion tour. Um, and a lot of fans were kind of, like, surprised that something that like that would come out on stage. But really a strong song. It was the B-side to Valerie. Um, and it did chart on some radio stations. But really, it's a strong song for being as far out as it is and for unmonkeys like as it is. Um, I think it's a great track. Daydream Believer, what is left to say about this song? I mean, it's an absolute um, blueprint for 60s pop perfection. It's got that huge sing-along chorus. It's got the big chanting vocals. It's got um, the dreamy, uh, you know, dream world kind of atmosphere to the song. It's just an absolute smash. It went to number one. It was released four months before this album. And I have a feeling this song and Valerie were added onto this album for appeal. Because the rest of the album, without those two songs, would be pretty lacking and pretty thin. Um, but adding those two songs on it gives it some dimension and gives it some pop appeal and some flavor and some texture. Um, I mean, Davey's vocals on this song are just absolutely fantastic. It's, it's one of the best 60s pop songs of all time. Um, and it was, I mean, it was produced by Chip Douglas because it was actually, you know, like, written earlier and released earlier. It was meant for their last album. It got released as a single instead. So... You know, as this album is produced by the Monkees, um, that one song happens to be produced by Chip Douglas. I think just that one. Maybe Valerie. Um, yeah, that's all I gotta say about that. I mean, we've heard that song a million times, and it's, it's a great song. It's one of those ones I don't get tired of. Writing Wrongs. This is an interesting track. Um, you know, coming from a band that was so rooted in the pop tradition, the pop rock tradition, to start expanding a little more um, is, can be slightly dangerous territory because you have bands that expect a sound from you. They expect a, an, ar an archetype that has been established and they want more of that tradition. And so when you go off the deep end and go into a little bit more of a, uh, an expressionism in free jamming, um, there's, there's a bit of a gamble there because you know a lot of fans probably would have picked up the needle after Daydream Believer and be like, whoop, sad too, let's put Mickey on. Um, that said, I happen to really like Writing Wrongs. I think it's a far out song. It's got these really cool rolling organs that add a nice dimension, these chugging drums, uh, that have like this caveman echoey beat to them. And Mike sings like he recorded his vocals down the hallway. He's kind of yelling the whole time. But I like that feeling. I like that vibe. Um, you know, it gets to a point where it kind of like trails off a little bit. And either a cat has walked on the piano or they've entered a, a, a paradise a free rhythm jamming um, that does kind of like meander a little bit. But I, I like hearing that. There's nothing more satisfying to me than hearing a jam on a record. I don't know. Maybe it's because I grew up with records or something. But like hearing a long extended jam on an LP, it's for me, feels good. It sounds good. I like hearing that, that breath happen. It's like when you play Toad or something by Cream or uh, uh, Moby Dick by Led Zeppelin. Like you, you go places with it. And it, that's kind of fun. That doesn't exist anymore. So it's kind of cool to hear something like that. And honestly, who doesn't love a good jam? I mean, the jam. Um, side two. This sounds like a Monkees album at this point. <laughs> side two is a little bit more of a Monkees. It's more of the Monkees. Um, I'll be back on my feet. I really, really like this song a lot. Mickey takes the lead on this. There's a great bouncing bass on this thing. Um, really peppy, sprightly guitars again. And Mickey's excellent vocal adds... Such a, a, a wonderful vibe to this track. Um, the horns on this song are just like a well-oiled machine, and they play off each other extremely well. Um, I love the, the bouncy rhythm guitar that is just like layering throughout this whole thing. And the chorus is so catchy. Um, you know, the up and down roller coaster kind of ride of, you know, um, the arc that it creates with the melody. I love that. I think it's a great song. And that's the first song on the album where I was like, whoa, that's the monkeys. 
You know, that sounds like a monkey song. So there's that. Uh, the Poster. This song is really, really cool, too. I, I love this song. Davy Jones co-wrote this one. And um, it's a really beautiful, upbeat song about the circus coming to town. What a fun idea to write a song about. Um, and only, I feel like only somebody like Davy Jones can get away with writing a song and singing a song like that and having it come across as being like, all right, I, I can dig this because <laughs> it's Davy Jones. You know, I, I think if like, I don't know, Robert Plant came out and sang a song, actually, I can see him singing about the circus. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Huh. Something to think about. Um, the really, like, bit of nostalgia on this song, I think, is what sells it. And Davy's voice has that air of nostalgia. He's got a bit of that 30s, um, you know, Gershwin type of song ability to his voice. Um, it's just a fun song. You know, when he sings, like, you know, I feel like I'm already there. It's just fun. Um, really great song. P.O. Box 9847. This song is excellent. This is probably one of my top three songs on the album. Um, Mickey takes lead on this one, and it's, it's a really groovy, psychedelic track. Um, the backwards uh, drum cymbals in the beginning, the slow crawl to the chorus, and then you get those like really trippy suspended vocals that get broken up by this distorted jumbled drum fill, and you're thrown back to the verse again. Um, and the harpsichord middle bit sounds like that song Green Tambourine. Um, it reminds me a lot of that, which would have been around that same period, so who knows if they lifted from them, but I definitely get an influence of the of the Lemon Vipers there. Um, but I do think it, it's, it's a fantastic song. I think Mickey really sells it. Magnolia Sims, um, yeah, don't adjust your player because it's supposed to sound like a 20s, 78 RPM record that's been played to death. Um, but, you know, Mike wrote this song, and he really works well in this, like, jazz combo mentality. Um, you know, he was branching out a lot more at this point, writing a whole lot of other songs that I think did like a slightly jazz-influenced album on his own at this point that got pretty decent reviews, but, um, you know, he really pulls off the like overly vaudevillian exaggerated vocals, um, you know, kind of like cartoony approach to, you know, old-timey ragtime music or something, or like jazz, like 20s jazz or something. Um, it's a fun song. It's not my favorite thing on here, but it's a fun song. Uh, and then you get Valerie. What a smash hit that song is. Like, holy moly, it sticks out like a sore thumb. This and Daydream Believer, if these songs weren't on the album, the album would probably be a bit of a snooze, and none of these other songs have basically been remembered in the Monkees' canon. If you walk up to somebody on the street and say, what do you think of the song Writing Wrongs by the Monkees? They'd be like, I know Last Train in Clarksville, and, uh, you know, Daydream Believer and Pleasant Valley Sunday, and, uh, you know, the Neil Diamond stuff, but... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, it's got that huge sing-along chorus, that wild tambourine. It's just an uplifting, youthful, uh, full of energy and full of life kind of track. It's just, it just grabs at you. And the shift between the chorus and the verses, it, the whole thing is just revved up and just ready to go the whole time. It's an outstanding track. And that, that guitar riff, and that whole like flamenco style in like a picking way, um, is absolutely phenomenal. Great song. And then you're throwing another curveball at the end with Zor and Zam, which is like this military marching thing. With really, It's a really short and quick song that builds and builds and builds and builds, and then it stops. But, um, I don't know, maybe it's like an anti-war song or something, but um, the really exploding brass that happened near the end, and uh, like the piano strings being pulled for that weird kind of disjointed feel. Um, it's a weird way to end the album, I gotta admit. It, it leaves you feeling completely, like, disassociated. Um, so that's the drawback on this album. It's not a bad album, and it's certainly just a collection of songs. There's no overreaching arc to this thing. There's no concept. There's no storyline. It's not meant to be taken as a theme. Um, you know, it's a pop album with pop songs on it, but the thing is, it's so disjointed. It's so all over the place, and for a band that was trying to prove themselves as a band... I don't know why they would have started doing something like this. They should have at least had two of them in the studio with some like alternating vocals, or at least doing their own vocals together. They could have come to the other studio and done background vocals for the other songs or something. Um, yeah, that's just my opinion. I feel like a little bit more band mentality would have helped this album go a lot further. 
Um, I mean, it did well for itself. It sold really well. It sold over a million copies. I mean, it's it, it did fine. But um, it was like the last big album by then. Because after this, the Head soundtrack came out, which no one went to see that movie. And then it was a slow decline from there. But some really great songs still in the pipeline. Like, Oh My My, that's a freaking great song. It's a great, great song. Um, you know, a couple albums in the future. But yeah, overall, I mean... It's not my favorite Monkees album. I don't know if I can pick one. Oof, that's a tough call. Because I like a lot of their songs. But, that said, this does have a lot of fantastic songs on it. I really do like Writing Wrongs, Tapioca Tundra, Daydream Believer, uh, Back on My Feet, The Poster, P.O. Box 9847, Valerie. So, I'd say like half of the album um, is really, 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 really strong. And the thing is, they recorded a ton of tracks, you know, like during this period. And... They compiled this, and none of Peter's songs made it on here, which is bizarre. If they had that many songs, I, at least one Peter song would have been cool. So, like, balanced representation may have been cool. Um, who knows? Who knows what was going on behind the scenes at Monkeys Incorporated back then. But, um, yeah, let me show you the label. Because I really do enjoy that Cole Jim's classic label. I don't have the original inner sleeve. I just have this plain white one, but... Um, this is a stereo copy, like I said, the mono copies are extremely hard to find, but someday I'd like to find one, just to hear what it sounds like. Um, some of the unreleased songs from this era are, are excellent and could have made this album be a little bit more beefier in terms of, like, quality. Um, it's really not a bad album, I, I do have to reiterate that, it's really not a bad album, but not my favorite. Uh, if I had to rate it, I'd probably give it, like, a six... Mm, maybe a seven, like a six-ish, six-ish seven, depending on what mood I'm in. Um, only, and I'd probably give it even lower if Daydream Believer and Valerie weren't on here. If those songs were on here, I'd probably give this thing a five. Because um, it's not the best thing they've ever done, and it could have been better. But it's a good listen. It's not an offensive listen. You're not going to be like pissed off that you put it on. There's some good stuff on here. There's some fluff, but... Um, what do you want, man? It's the monkeys. It's, it's, it's the monkeys, man. They're meant to be fun. So that's it. My name is Giggins. This has been Album Reviews with the birds, the bees, and the monkeys. Um, yeah, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, and um, that's, that, that's all I got. I, I, I have nothing else to say, so bye-bye.